Hello, everyone. Um, I just made it here. The jet lag's not really doing super well for me. But so if my talk doesn't make any sense, it's likely because I made it last night and I've only slept four hours. So just ask me any questions at any point of the talk. And um, I picked this new talk to talk about because yesterday I gave a talk at AI Cross Space. So I figured I need to make a new talk for this audience. So I don't repeat giving the same talk. Um, this is the work with Miles Kramer, my students at Princeton. And uh, he's excellent. You guys should probably have seen similar talk at the NERFS uh, Machine Learning and Physical Sciences um, just this past December. And I'm with Wei Su, who's also my students at Princeton. Uh, they're both second year students, and Peter Battaglia at DeepMind. So this is about learning physical laws with, machine, with deep learning very quickly. And I'm not talking about learning new physical laws yet. I mean, this is possibly a direction that we can go to because this is not yet artificial general intelligence talk. I don't, I don't look like Demis has this. So, so we're trying to derive physical laws that we already know, at least for now, that governs the universe. This is a simulation, it's a hydrodynamic simulation of the universe that has been simulated including gravity, dark matter, dark energy, and with gravity and hydro and magnetohydrodynamics, that's an explosion of supernova. And even this simulation is not perfect, right? And so in principle, we can try to understand what's happening in the universe by looking and observing a bunch of data sets. In this case, maybe it's observing a simulation that's complex, or maybe something a lot simpler, like balls bouncing within four walls. And we actually made something, we're going to look at something even simpler than this, which actually would talk to the planetary folks, if there are any planetary folks in here, is that we can actually try to look at a bunch of simulated planetary system orbiting each other and try to find the physical laws that govern it. That seems very, very simple. And there are a couple other examples that we're gonna use. Um, the reason we wanna try to do this is because the previous method, um, if people have been paying attention in this area, um, is basically led by someone, um, the group by Schmidt and Lipson in 2009, I think they have a science paper. And they've already com basically combined you know, at that point, it was just very simple, deep network. It's not even deep, actually, neural net with symbolic regression to find the physical laws back then. And it's really computationally intensive because symbolic regression itself is basically a search through a tree um, with all the different components of the equations that you want to try. If it's actual some of the components of the equations, you throw in, you know, velocity, positions, times, you know, division, exponential, all the different components that you want, and you do a search after you watch basically the system for a while. So we're gonna do something a little bit different here and using graphical network combining with symbolic regression today. So can we use convolution neural net? This is what Schmidt and Lipson had done with a science paper in 2009, but not really. It turns out it's a lot easier to do it with something else. We know that we can deal with images or cubes of images like 3D convolution and send them over layers of neural nets. It can be very deep or it just, you know, multiple layers, like two or three layers. But for problems we talked about, there are no obvious convolution to do that that conserves con information because you're always chopping into grids and pixels. You're always losing some information no matter what you do. If you're doing just a simple convolution neural net with, you know, basically pixel images, we cannot simply convolve over these, you know, balls bouncing within four walls or this planetary system that will retain all the information. So what do we do? As I was saying, suggesting earlier, we're gonna use a graph. It's a natural way to represent the entities and the relation. If Danilo is awake yet and is in the audience, he's the person you should really talk to graph near that. He's um, one of the earlier authors, one of the main authors in um, Interaction Network, which we're gonna use in our work here. Um, so a lot of physical laws involve N bodies where n larger than or equal to two. So graph is a natural way to represent these entities and the relationship. Um, let me try to point. So basically we have nodes that somehow is re represented by v1, v2, v3, and you have edges here. Nodes here represent the entities. If you look at the balls bouncing off the wall or the balls which are planets here, you can just think of it as masses and say positions and velocities. That will be the attributes of the nodes. And then you have all the edges, the relationship, the interactions. In our case, it's pretty obvious. It will be like the gravitation law. In this case, probably just Newton's law. So this will be the thing. Sometimes it can be bidirectional, the forces, and sometimes it can be you know, just unidirectional. 
the inferences about entities and relationship respect this graphical structure, so it has to be in this structure. And graphs can capture very complex um, relation systems, such as molecules, stuff that I know nothing about. The rigid body system, I know a little bit more. Um, mass brain system, which we're actually going to use in one of our experiments. And sentence and parse trees, which I'm not doing NLP, but you can also imagine how these things will work out. And envoy system, which we'll concentrate quite a bit about. And you can definitely use it for images and looking at you know, fully content seen graphs, but that's not what we're going to do today because we're going to concentrate on the physics side of things. Um, but we're going to just do a few really boring graphs, uh, uh, plots, because I want to make sure people get all the you know, nitty-gritty details here. Um, so we're going to talk about specifically more in this n-body systems, where u is a global attribute vector of l u, and then you have basically all the set node attributes vectors. So again, these are the masses, uh, positions, velocities. If the masses are the same, you don't actually need to worry about too much. The edges is basically a set of edge attributes, basically characteristic of certain length, depending on how many edges. Is it one direction or two direction? And is it a basically, is it a receiver? Or for each of the nodes, it can be receiving or basically emitting. So these are very simple things when you put it in the context of n-body interactions, because these will just be masses and these will be just interaction like forces. Well, masses and positions and velocities to be exact. And you can have a global attribute, which is the U here. The global attributes for the physicists in the crowd, which might be everybody, it could be like, you know, the total conserved energy, conserved angular momentum, or Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, like that kind of conserved quantities that can be the global properties U. Okay, and so let's see how we actually do this. We're first going to consider the edge function, which will just basically compute the message from the node and edge attributes associated with an edge. So we basically calculate the forces. You know, if you have g equals to m1, m2 over r squared, you're just going to calculate that. And then you have the node function. You're basically summing up all the forces from all the different nodes. That's a pretty easy one for this crowd, I suspect. And then you can train the system and backprock it to actually get the correct next step of the system. So this all seems very easy for everybody. But when I first learned it, I thought that was very confusing, <laughs> just to be sure. Because it's, it looks like deep set. It doesn't exactly look like deep set. It looks like a bunch of other things that you've seen before. But it's not exactly that. I mean, they can represent deep set, apparently. Um, so what are we doing today? We're going to learn to simulate and find the force laws of the following system. But before I move into the experiment itself, do we have any questions? Because I'm barely awake myself. It's like 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. for me. Actually, 3 a.m. No questions? Yes. Uh, what? We, we haven't got there yet. But that explains that I'm not very clear. I just sort of explain what structure we're going to use. Yes? Yes, so, so we actually keep everything that was close by. But we also don't have a very large system. You'll see we're only training for three bodies and then later on to be like six, seven, eight bodies. They're like actually not going to go very far just because there's gravity. Um, so the setup of the simulations, there's a bunch of them. So there's one over R force law, one over R square force law in 2D for three bodies. Um, there's one over R square force law in 3D for three bodies. And later on, you'll see that we change the three to different numbers for later experiments. We have string with one over R square force law in 2D. We have 100,000 simulations each and 1,000 time steps each. So basically, these two experiments. And so imagine we're going to pick the simplest situation. We're going to look at three planetary systems, so orbiting each other. And you want to take one single time step of three planets interacting with each other at time t, go to time t prime. So some machine learning model in between, that's what we're going to do. And here's the model. It's very, very, very simple, and it's deliberately so, because we want to make sure it's the simplest network, and it's going to do it really fast to find the physical laws also. And you don't really need to build a very complex network for this one. So we have all the nodes. We know the nodes attributes. We find all the node pairs. You use the first MLP. 
and then you basically find and update all the different messages. You sum all the messages to the node. You see a second MLP here. You update the node. When you updated the node, you basically backprop it back to learn the simulator. So that seems very simple, but I'm gonna walk it through this time. And for simplicity, we skip the global property here. There is a bunch of work coming up with the Hamiltonian, what coming came up with the Hamiltonian neural net that will be very interesting to apply this here where you know the Hamiltonian is the special property of the system. And the edge has no special attributes, so it's fairly simple. We have the nodes with the positions as a function of time. They're all of the same mass, so we actually can forget the mass here because the mass is all the same. Um, the graphical network process the graphs first by computing all the pairwise interactions and then between the nodes and with the message function. And we want to, at some point, find what the messages are. Then we calculate some messages on the, the incident node and update the node. Now you can predict the node attribute the next time step in backprop it to find the best weight. The loss function is basically a function of the node attributes like positions and velocities. So very simple outcome. We're able to predict the next steps. So that was pretty good. Um, we basically repeated and calculated what uh, Peter and Danilo and others have done and made sure they all basically completely recover what they have done already back in 2016. And so you're asking, why is this paper even talked about in NERVS last you know, December? That's because what's more about this paper as I said earlier, we want to minimize the dimension. We actually use something called the physics inductive bias, but honestly, to be very simple, it just we want to we know what's the dimension of the forces we're talking about here. Is it 2D system or is it 3D system or whatever D system? So in order that this is interesting, we want to basically find the forces here by using the symbolic regression. So we use symbolic regression to learn the forces between all the nodes which is actually surprisingly slow. And if you use the previous work people have used, um, it's an open source package called Eureka, it's gonna take a long time if you don't limit the dimension here. So this edge attribute can be learned to be the relevant forces between the nodes, but you really need to minimize the dimension here to make sure that it actually runs really, really, really fast. So do we learn the force laws of the following all these different systems that we simulate and yes, we can. Sorry, I'm still missing Obama. Um, <laughs> these plots determine the graph network's messages have learned to be the linear transformations. So if this is one to one, you can see it's actually a very flat line for uh, of the two factor components of the true force for the one over R law in 2D. And you actually see all the other plots if you want to look at for 3D and all the other systems. So we thought that was pretty cool. Even better, this thing generalizes to larger system and when you minimize the message passing, you know, may basically make it very, very um, exactly to the dimension or lower, it will actually generalize this better. I'll show you here. The generalization works better if you limit the dimension of the message passing. I know this is a fairly complex plot, but let me just go through it a little bit. So here's the different dimensions for the message passing. So when we know it's a 2D or 3D system, Right, some of them are 2D systems, some of them are 3D systems. And if you use 10 or 50, you will see something here. This is plugging loss function. This is number of bodies on the right axis here. And we were training with like three bodies and you see, okay, are we actually improve, or actually training with six or training with four? And are we gonna generalize better if you decrease the dimension? And you can see that when it is at the right dimensions, it's actually doing pretty well at three dimensions for the blue line here. When it's two dimension, it's not great even from the beginning because you know it's not the right force laws actually. When it's 10 or 50, and you can see it basically shot up at nine-ish bodies, while if you do 3D, it's actually gonna generalize this further out. So this is kind of interesting summary because we don't usually expect the generalization, this zero shot learning to work, but the fact that it works, which is what uh, Peter and Danilo already pointed out last time, they actually had generalized, but the fact that it generalized better when you find this force loss, when you 
minimize the dimension in the message passing and made it really fast at the same time. So generalize is better and it's faster when you put in physical inductive bias into the system. So I thought this is a actually pretty cool work in that sense. So let's see. So other examples that people have done, and I thought that was pretty cool just because I love, you know, what graphical network can do. You can predict invisible springs in a mass spring system. Here is the input to the system, a bunch of balls bouncing. And you're gonna to try to find the little invisible springs in this mass spring system. And here is the model and the truth. So you could not have seen those little mass spring system here. This, the invisible springs is actually just right there. Or you can generalize to the point light walkers. This is not our work, but I just thought it was really cool. I mean, by eye, you can tell where the connections are. But for the system to figure it out, it's actually pretty hard, right? And for physicists, this is a lot of interesting questions to ask if there's something invisible force laws or invisible parts in a system that you want to predict. I think this is a pretty cool method to do. Oops. So I want to show it together. All right, so this is a quick conclusion already. I'll be happy to take questions. It seems that we can learn from a set of simulations and generate more of the same without running the simulations again. This is something, if you look at my group's work, we do a lot of cosmological simulations, the one at the very early beginning. We can generate a lot more of the same without running simulations again, but usually it doesn't generalize well to larger N systems. So those are things that we can't just generalize very easily. We actually aren't able to try much yet except for one case. Um, and that's the case with the cosmological simulations with N bodies. And it's only talk about gravity and it's many, many bodies. It's about 100,000 bodies interacting at the same time. And it generalizes as well. And this is a PNAS paper you guys can take a look at to different latent parameters that generate the systems. So for those who have heard my talk yesterday, you're like, okay, you talked about this. So I'm not gonna draw on this. But here, the cool thing is you actually are trying to find new physical laws or maybe physical laws you already know um, to combine with the graphical network and the symbolic regression to find the rules that govern the forces between the nodes. But as I said earlier, the symbolic regression is fairly slow and it cannot handle like a large number of um, basically different components you can put in. So maybe the neural programming synthesis may be even cooler. We don't know. The algorithm is trying to do it too with our neural programming synthesis right now. Um, in our case, in this paper here, we include inductive bias in the message passing. That actually helps find a physical law a lot faster than before, and it generalizes even better for the larger n when this inductive bias is included for finding the new physical laws. So graphical network rocks, and you can talk to Danilo, who's here, who knows way more about graphical network than me. Um, they are really great, and I will stop here and take questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thanks. So, so did I understand well that limiting the dimension of the messages is basically limiting over parametrization of the graph neural network? And Probably. if that's the case, then then in a sense, when you limit it, you don't see you do see overfitting if you don't limit it. But that goes kind of a against what we see in deep learning very often that having more and more parameters is actually not causing overfitting. So I'm just wondering how these are reconciled. Yeah, I have really thought about this very carefully. Like, you know, if you have the system train and validate it, you should not basically overfit, even if you allow the message passing to be, you know, sort of freely floating. But um, yeah, we haven't actually tried this, but it would be good to try to see whether we can just take the system, put in like a large L, and then see what happens. It just doesn't generalize that well, and it runs super slowly. But maybe we should try to train really hard and see what happens with large. Oh, we also have, we also need less data set. I think that's another thing, less training set. But that's related to the complexity of the system also, because if you don't have a, such a large system, it will be less, it will be easier to train. This is a good question, yes.
Although for that one, for the right-hand plots, the L equals 50 is doing worse than L equals 10. For the left hand, it's true. So the left. So this one was trained with uh, six bodies on the left, and that was trained with four bodies on the right. So the four body one is probably more relevant to read because you're actually going further out from what your trained you know, system is, because you're training with four, and you're trying to go to 12. I'll let the... Um, yeah, thanks very much um, for a really nice... Um, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, so one of the things I was wondering is if you had like, um, instead of two body interactions in the real Hamiltonian, if you had something more complicated, would you just have to have a really large graph neural network to get all these interactions in place? Or how would you, would it be able to generalize well in that kind of case? I think it does, but Daniela, do you have uh, other suggestions? Just simulating a, 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 a thanks, uh, Shirley. So, GraphNet is just simulating pairwise forces, but uh, if you have, uh, let's say, five layers of GraphNet and you allow messages to propagate for, through more than two, so in principle, could still use the pairwise interactions. Otherwise, the number of uh, links would blow up, right? The, the combinatorics would be uh, not very favorable. Yeah. Any attempt to use a convolutional layer to try to fit with the many similar um, rules on different nodes? So are you saying there are different rules the, on different um, nodes or different on the fact On the fact that uh, it doesn't work as well when you add nodes, uh, when you add bodies, different, several, um, uh, when you enlarge the, 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 um, the case, uh, uh -huh. did you try to put a convolutional layer uh, and the assumption that some interactions are similar between two different nodes? Not that I'm aware of. But there is, um, there's another piece of work that we're doing right now that actually looks at predicting the stability of a planetary system. This is more physics-ish. So where if you're given the first 10,000 years of planetary system interacting with each other, can you predict what happened 10 to 9 years from now? And we're going to use this graphical network also. We also did it with a very simple so convolution style with um, an autoencoder to basically sort an autoencoder to try to find what attributes you need to glim from the planetary orbits and then do a prediction on the stability of systems. But now we're going to try to see whether we can do it with the graphical network. But we'll see. So that's another thing that we'll, we'll touch on using convolution, but not for this block. Are there any other questions? So if not, let, let's Thank thanks you. Shirley again for a very nice talk.